Chapters 15 and 16 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 The Great Crusade. I was in great beading this morning, said Dick, as he sat at luncheon with his father, and the blinds were up in Aunt Margaret's house. They have returned from their holiday then? his father observed with a tremor in his voice. He looked afraid then he looked annoyed pettifer will break down if he doesn't take care he exclaimed petulantly no man with any sense would work as hard as he does he ought to have taken two months this year at the least we should still have to meet aunt margaret at the end of them said dick calmly he had no belief in mr hazlewood's distress at the overwork of pettifer a month had passed since the inauguration of the great crusade and though talk was rife everywhere and indignation in many places loud a certain amount of success had been won but all this while mrs pettifer had been away now she had returned mr hazlewood stood in some awe of his sister she was not ill-natured but she knew her mind and expressed it forcibly and without delay she was of a practical limited nature she saw very clearly what she saw but she walked in blinkers and had neither comprehension of nor sympathy with those of a wider vision she was at this time a woman of forty comfortable to look upon and the wife of mr robert pettifer the head of the well-known firm of solicitors pettifer grill and musgrave mrs pettifer had very little patience to spare for the idiosyncrasies of her brother though she owed him a good deal more than patience for at the time, some twenty years before, when she had married Robert Pettifer, then merely a junior partner of the firm, Harold Hazlewood had alone stood by her. To the rest of the family she was throwing herself away. To her brother Harold she was doing a fine thing, not because it was a fine thing, but because it was an exceptional thing. Robert Pettifer, however, had prospered, and though he had reached an age when he might have claimed his leisure, the nine o'clock train still took him daily to london aunt margaret isn't after all so violent said dick for whom she kept a very soft place in her heart but harold shook his head your aunt richard has all the primeval ferocity of the average woman and then the fires of the enthusiast were set alight in his blue eyes i'll tell you what i'll do i'll send her my new pamphlet richard it may have a humanizing influence upon her. I have some advanced copies. I'll send her one this afternoon. Dick's eyes twinkled. I should if I were you, though to be sure, sir, we have tried that plan before without any prodigious effect. True, Richard, true, but I have never before risen to such heights as these. Mr. Hazlewood threw down his napkin and paced the room. Richard, I am not inclined to boast. I am a humble man. It is only humility, sir, which achieves great work, said Dick, as he went contentedly on with his luncheon. But the very title of this pamphlet seems to me calculated to interest the careless and attract the thoughtful. It is called The Prison Walls Must Cast No Shadow. With an arm outstretched, he seemed to deliver the words of the title one by one from the palm of his hand. Then he stood smiling, confident, awaiting applause. Dick's face, which had shown the highest expectancy, slowly fell into a profound disappointment. He laid down his knife and fork. Oh, come, father, all walls cast shadows. It entirely depends upon the altitude of the sun. Mr. Hazlewood returned to his seat and spoke gently. The phrase, my boy, is a metaphor. I develop in this pamphlet my belief that a convict, once he has expiated his offence, should upon his release be restored to the precise position in society which he held before with all its privileges unimpaired. Dick chuckled in the most unregenerate delight. You are going it, father, he said, and disappointment came to Mr. Hazlewood. Richard, he remonstrated mildly, i hoped that i should have your approval it seemed to me that a change was taking place in you 
that the player of polo the wild hunter of an inoffensive little white ball was developing into the humanitarian well sir rejoined dick i won't deny that of late i have been beginning to think that there is a good deal in your theories but you mustn't try me too hard at the beginning you know i am only in my novitiate however please send it to aunt margaret and oh how i would like to hear her remarks upon it an idea occurred to mr hazlewood richard why shouldn't you take it over yourself this afternoon dick shook his head impossible father i have something to do he looked out of the window down to the river running dark in the shade of the trees but i'll go to-morrow morning he added and the next morning he walked over early to great beading his aunt would have received the pamphlet by the first post and he wished to seize the first fine careless rapture of her comments but he found her in a mood of distress rather than of wordy impatience the pettifers lived in a big house of the georgian period at the bottom of an irregular square in the middle of the little town mrs pettifer was sitting in a room facing the garden at the back with the pamphlet on a little table beside her she sprang up as dick was shown into the room and before he could utter a word of greeting she cried dick you are the one person i wanted to see oh yes sit down dick obeyed dick i believe you are the only person in the world who has any control over your father yes even in my pinafores i learnt the great lesson that to control one's parents is the first duty of the modern child don't be silly his aunt rejoined sharply then she looked him over yes you must have some control over him for he lets you remain in the army though an army is one of his abominations theoretically it's a great grief to him replied dick but you see i have done fairly well so actually he's ready to burst with pride every sentimental philosopher sooner or later breaks his head against his own theories mrs pettifer nodded her head in commendation that's an improvement on your last remark dick it's true and your father's going to break his head very badly unless you stop him how mrs ballantyne all the flippancy died out of dick hazlewood's face he became at once grave wary i have been hearing about him continued mrs pettifer he has made friends with her a woman who has stood in the dock on a capital charge and has been acquitted dick hazlewood added quietly and mrs pettifer blazed up she wouldn't have been acquitted if i had been on the jury a parcel of silly men who were taken in by a pretty face she cried and dick broke in aunt margaret i am sorry to interrupt you but i want you to understand that i am with my father heart and soul in this he spoke very slowly and deliberately and mrs pettifer was utterly dismayed you she cried she grew pale and alarm so changed her face it was as if a tragic mask had been slipped over it oh dick not you yes i i think it is cruelly hard he continued with his eyes relentlessly fixed upon mrs pettifer's face that a woman like mrs ballantyne who has endured all the horrors of a trial the publicity the suspense the dread risk that justice might miscarry should have afterwards to suffer the treatment of a leper there was for the moment no room for any anger now in mrs pettifer's thoughts consternation possessed her she weighed every quiet firm word that fell from dick she appreciated the feeling which gave them wings she searched his face his eyes dick had none of his father's flightiness he was level-headed shrewd and with the conventions of his times and his profession if dick spoke like this with so much certitude and so much sympathy why then she shrank from the conclusion with a sinking heart she became very quiet oh she shouldn't have come to little beading she said in a low voice staring now upon the ground it was to herself she spoke but dick answered her and his voice rose to a challenge why shouldn't she here she was born here she was known what else should she do but come back to little beading and hold her head high i respect her pride for doing it here were reasons no doubt 
why Stella should come back, but they did not include the reason why she had. Dick Hazlewood was well aware of it. He had learned it only the afternoon before when he was with her on the river. But he thought it a reason too delicate, of too fine a gossamer to be offered to the prosaic mind of his Aunt Margaret. With what ridicule and disbelief she would rend it into tatters! Reasons so exquisite were not for her. She could never understand them. Mrs. Pettifer abandoned her remonstrances, and was for dropping the subject altogether, but Dick was obstinate. "'You don't know Mrs. Ballantyne, Aunt Margaret. You are unjust to her because you don't know her. I want you to,' he said boldly. "'What?' cried Mrs. Pettifer. "'You actually—' "'Oh!' Indignation robbed her of words. She gasped. "'Yes, I do,' continued Dick calmly. "'I want you to come one night and dine at Little Beading. "'We'll persuade Mrs. Ballantyne to come, too.' It was a bold move, and even in his eyes it had its risks for Stella. To bring Mrs. Pettifer and her together was, so it seemed to him, to mix earth with delicate flame. But he had great faith in Stella Ballantyne. Let them but meet, and the earth might melt. Who could tell? At the worst his aunt would bristle, and there were his father and himself to see that the bristles did not prick. Yes, come and dine. Mrs. Pettifer had got over her amazement at her nephew's audacity. Curiosity had taken its place. Curiosity and fear. She must see this woman for herself. Good. We'll fix up a date and write to you. Good-bye. Dick went back to Little Beading and asked for his father. The old gentleman added to his other foibles that of a collector. It was the only taste he had which was really productive, for he owned a collection of miniatures, gathered together throughout his life, which would have realized a fortune if it had been sold at Christie's. He kept it arranged in cabinets in the library, and Dick found him bending over one of the drawers and rearranging his treasures. "'I have seen Aunt Margaret,' he said. "'She will meet Stella here for dinner.' "'That will be splendid!' cried the old man with enthusiasm. Perhaps, replied his son, and the next morning the Pettifers received their invitation. Mrs. Pettifer accepted it at once. She had not been idle since Dick had left her. Before he had come she had merely looked upon the crusade as one of Harold Hazlewood's stupendous follies. But after he had gone she was generally horrified. She saw Dick speaking with the set dogged look and the hard eyes which once or twice she had seen before. He had always got his way, she remembered, on those occasions. She drove round to her friends and made inquiries. At each house her terrors were confirmed. It was Dick now who led the crusade. He had given up his polo, he was spending all his leave at Little Beading, and most of it with Stella Ballantyne. He lent her a horse and rode with her in the morning, he rode her on the river in the afternoon, he bullied his friends to call on her. He brandished his friendship with the like of flag. Love me, love my Stella, was his new motto. Mrs. Pettifer drove home with every fear exaggerated. Dick's career would be ruined altogether, even if nothing worse were to happen. To any view that Stella Ballantyne might hold, she hardly gave a thought. She was sure of what it would be. Stella Ballantyne would jump at her nephew. He had good looks, social position, money, and a high reputation. It was the last quality which would give him a unique value in Stella Ballantyne's eyes. He was not one of the chinless who haunt the stage doors, nor again one of that more subtly decadent class which seeks to attract sensation by linking itself to notoriety. No, from Stella's point of view, Dick Hazlewood must be the ideal husband. Mrs. Pettifer waited for her husband's return that evening, with unusual impatience, but she was wise enough to hold her tongue until dinner was over, and he, with a cigar between his lips and a glass of old brandy on the tablecloth in front of him, disposed to amiability and concession. Then, however, she related her troubles. "'You see, it must be stopped, Robert.' Robert Pettifer, who was a lean, wiry man of fifty-five, whose brown dried face seen by a sort of climatic change 
to have taken on the colour of the bindage of his law books he too was a little troubled by the story but he was of a fair and cautious mind stopped he said how we can't arrest mrs ballantyne again no replied mrs pettifer robert you must do something robert pettifer jumped in his chair i margaret lord love you no i decline to mix myself up in the matter at all dick's a grown man and mrs ballantyne has been acquitted margaret pettifer knew her husband is that your last word she asked ruefully absolutely it isn't mine robert robert pettifer chuckled and laid a hand upon his wife's i know that margaret we are going to dine next friday night at little beading to meet stella ballantyne mr pettifer was startled but he held his tongue the invitation came this morning after you had left for london she added and you accepted it at once yes pettifer was certain that she had before she opened her mouth to answer him i shall dine at little beading on friday he said because harold always gives me an admirable glass of vintage port and with that he dismissed the subject mrs pettifer was content to let it smoulder in his mind she was not quite sure that he was as disturbed as she wished him to be but that he was proud of dick she knew and if by any chance uneasiness grew strong in him why sooner or later he would let fall some little sentence and that little sentence would probably be useful end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen consequences the dinner party at little beading was a small affair there were but ten altogether who sat down at mr hazlewood's dinner table and with the exception of the pettifers all owing to dick hazlewood's insistence were declared partisans of stella ballantyne none the less stella came to it with hesitation it was the first time that she had dined abroad since she had left india now the best part of eighteen months ago and she went forth to it as to an ordeal for though friends of hers would be present to enhearten her she was to meet the pettifers the redoubtable aunt margaret had spoiled her sleep for a week it was for the pettifers she dressed careful to choose neither white nor black lest they should find something symbolic in the colour of her gown and make of it an offence she put on a frock of pale blue satin trimmed with some white lace which had belonged to her mother and she wore not so much as a thin gold chain about her neck but she did not need jewels that night the months of quiet had restored to her her beauty the excitement of this evening had given life and colour to her face the queer little droop at the corners of her lips which had betrayed so much misery and bitterness of spirit had vanished altogether yet when she was quite dressed and her mirror bade her take courage she sat down and wrote a note of apology pleading a sudden indisposition but she did not send it even in the writing her cowardice came home to her and she tore it up before she had signed her name the wheels of the cab which was to take her to the big house rattled down the lane under her windows and slipping her cloak over her shoulders she ran downstairs the party began with a little constraint mr hazlewood received his guest in his drawing-room and it had the chill and the ceremony of a room which is seldom used but the constraint wore off at the table most of those present were striving to set stella ballantyne at her ease and she was at a comfortable distance from mrs pettifer with mr hazlewood at her side she was conscious that she was kept under observation and from time to time the knowledge made her uncomfortable i am being watched she said to her host you mustn't mind replied mr hazlewood and the smile came back to her lips as she glanced round the table oh i don't i don't she said in a low voice for i have friends here and friends who will not fail you stella said the old man to-night begins the great change you'll see robert pettifer puzzled her indeed more than his wife she was plain to read she was frigidly polite her enemy once or twice however stella turned her head to find robert pettifer's eyes resting upon her with a quiet scrutiny which betrayed nothing of his thoughts 
as a matter of fact he liked her manner she was neither defiant nor servile neither loud nor over silent she had been through fire that was evident but it was evident only because of a queer haunting look which came and went in her dark eyes the fire had not withered her indeed pettifer was surprised he had not formulated his expectations at all but he had not expected what he saw the clear eyes and the fresh delicate colour her firm white shoulders and the depth of her bosom forced him to think of her as wholesome he began to turn over in his mind his recollections of her case recollections which he had been studious not to revive halfway through the dinner stella lost her uneasiness the lights the ripple of talk the company of men and women the bright dresses had their effect on her it was as though after a deep plunge into dark waters she had come to the surface and flung out her arms to the sun she ceased to notice the scrutiny of the pettifers she looked across the table to dick and their eyes met and such a look of tenderness transfigured her face as made mrs pettifer turn pale the woman's in love she said to herself and she was horrified it wasn't dick's social position then or the shelter of his character that stella ballantyne coveted she was in love mrs pettifer was honest enough to acknowledge it but she knew now that the danger which she had feared was infinitely less than the danger which actually was i must have it out with harold to-night she said and later on when the men came from the dining-room she looked out for her husband but at first she did not see him she was in the drawing-room and the wide double doors which led to the big library stood open it was through those doors that the men had come some of the party were gathered there she could hear the click of the billiard balls and the voices of women mingling with those of the men she went through the doors and saw her husband standing by harold hazlewood's desk and engrossed apparently in some little paper-covered book which he held in his hand she crossed to him at once robert she said don't be in a hurry to go to-night i must have a word with harold all right said pettifer but he said it in so absent a voice that his wife doubted whether he had understood her words she was about to repeat them when harold hazlewood himself approached you are looking at my new pamphlet pettifer the prison walls must cast no shadow i am hoping that it will have a great influence no replied pettifer i wasn't i was looking at this and he held up the little book oh that said hazlewood turning away with disappointment yes that said pettifer with a strange and thoughtful look at his brother-in-law and i am not sure he added slowly that in a short time you will not find it the more important publication of the two he laid the book down and in his turn he moved away towards the billiard-table margaret pettifer remained she had been struck by the curious deliberate words her husband had used was this the hint for which she was looking out she took up the little book it was a copy of notes and queries she opened it it was a small periodical magazine made up of printed questions which contributors sent in search of information and answers to those questions from the pens of other contributors mrs pettifer glanced through the leaves hoping to light upon the page which her husband had been studying but he had closed the book when he laid it down and she found nothing to justify his remark yet he had not spoken without intention of that she was convinced and her conviction was strengthened the next moment for as she turned away again towards the drawing-room robert pettifer looked once sharply towards her and as sharply away mrs pettifer understood that glance he was wondering whether she had noticed what in the magazine had interested him but she did not pursue him with questions she merely made up her mind to examine the copy of notes and queries at a time when she could bring more leisure to the task she waited impatiently for the party to break up but eleven o'clock had struck before any one proposed to go then all took their leave at once robert pettifer and his wife went out into the hall with the rest lest others seeing them remain should stay behind too 
and whilst they stood a little apart from the general bustle of departure margaret pettifer saw stella ballantyne come lightly down the stairs and a savage fury suddenly whirled at her head and turned her dizzy she thought of all the trouble and harm this young woman was bringing into their ordered family and she would not have it that she was innocent she saw stella with her cloak open upon her shoulders radiant and glistening and slender against the dark panels of the staircase youth in her face enjoyment sparkling in her eyes and her fingers itched to strip her of her bright frock her gloves her slim satin slippers the delicate white lace which nestled against her bosom she clothed her in the heavy shapeless garments the coarse shoes and stockings of the convict she saw her working desperately against time upon an ignoble task with black and broken fingernails if longing could have worked a miracle thus at this hour would stella ballantyne have sat and worked all the colour of her faded to a hideous drab all the grace of her withered mrs pettifer turned away with so abrupt a movement and so disordered a face that robert asked her if she was ill no it's nothing she said and against her will her eyes were drawn back to the staircase but stella ballantyne had disappeared and margaret pettifer drew her breath in relief she felt that there had been danger in her moment of passion danger and shame and already enough of those two evils waited about them stella meanwhile with a glance towards dick hazlewood had slipped back into the big room then she waited for a moment until the door opened and dick came in i had not said good night to you she exclaimed coming towards him and giving him her hands and i wanted to say it to you here when we were alone for i must thank you for to-night you and your father oh i have no words the tears were very near to her eyes and they were audible in her low voice dick hazlewood was quick to answer her good for there's need of none will you ride to-morrow stella took her hands from his and moved across the room towards the great bay window with its glass doors i should love to she said eight is that too early after to-night no that's the good time she returned with a smile we have the day at its best and the world to ourselves i'll bring the same horse round he knows you now doesn't he thank you said stella she unlatched the glass door and opened it you'll lock it after me won't you no said dick i'll see you to your door but stella refused his company she stood in the doorway there's no need see what a night it is and the beauty of it crept into her soul and stilled her voice the moon rode in a blue sky a disk of glowing white the great cedar trees flung their shadows wide open the bright lawns and not a branch stirred listen said stella in a whisper and the river rippling against its banks with now a deep sob and now a fairy's laugh sang to them in notes most musical and clear that liquid melody and the flutter of a bird's wings in the bough of a tree were the only sounds they stood side by side she looking out over the garden to the dim and pearly hills he gazing at her uplifted face and the pure column of her throat they stood in a most dangerous silence the air came cool and fresh to their nostrils stella drew it in with a smile good night she laid her hand for a second on his arm don't come with me why not and the answer came in a clear whisper i am afraid stella seemed to feel the man at her side suddenly grow very still it's only a step she went on quickly and she passed out of the window on to the pathway. Dick Hazlewood followed, but she turned to him and raised her hand. "'Don't,' she pleaded. The voice was troubled, but her eyes were steady. "'If you come with me, I shall tell you.' "'What?' he interrupted, and the quickness of the interruption broke the spell which the night had laid upon her. "'I shall tell you again how much I thank you,' she said lightly. "'I shall cross the meadow by the garden gate, that brings me to my door she gathered her skirt in her hand 
and crossed the pathway to the edge of the grass. "'You can't do that!' exclaimed Dick, and he was at her side. He stooped and felt the turf. "'Even the lawn's drenched. Crossing the meadow you'll be ankle-deep in dew. You must promise never to go home across the meadow when you dine with us.' He spoke, chiding her, as if she had been a mutinous child, and with so much anxiety that she laughed. "'You see, you have become rather precious to me,' he added. Though the month was July, she, that night, was all April, half tears, half laughter. The smile passed from her lips, and she raised her hands to her face with the swiftness of one who has been struck. "'What's the matter?' he asked, and she drew her hand away. "'Don't you understand?' she asked, and answered the question herself. "'No, why should you?' She turned to him suddenly, her bosom heaving, her hands clenched. "'Do you know what place I fill here, in my own county? Years ago, when I was a child, there was supposed to be a pig-faced woman in great beading. She lived in a small yellow cottage in the square. It was pointed out to strangers as one of the sights of the town. Sometimes they were shown her shadow after dusk, between the lamp and the blind.' Sometimes you might have even caught a glimpse of her slinking late at night along the dark alleys. Well, the pig-faced woman has gone, and I have taken her place. No, cried Dick, that's not true. It is, she answered passionately. I am the curiosity, I am the freak. The townspeople take a pride in me, yes, just the same pride they took in her, and I find that pride more difficult to bear than all the aversion of the Pettifers. I, too, slink out early in the morning, or late after night has fallen. And you, the passion of bitterness died out of her voice, her hands opened and hung at her sides, a smile of tenderness shone on her face. You come with me, you ride with me early. With you I learn to take no heed. You welcome me to your house, you speak to me as you spoke just now. Her voice broke, and a cry of gladness escaped from her, which went to Dick Hazelwood's heart. Oh, you shall see me to my door. I'll not cross the meadow. I'll go round by the road. She stopped and drew a breath. I'll tell you something. What? It's rather good to be looked after. I know. It has never happened to me before. Yes, it's very good and she drew out the words with a low laugh of happiness. "'Stella,' he said, and at the moment of her name she caught her hands up to her heart. "'Oh, thank you!' The hall door was closed, and all but one car had driven away when they turned the corner of the house and came out in the broad drive. They walked in the moonlight with a perfume of flowers in the air, and the big yellow cups of the evening primroses gleaming on either side. They walked slowly. Stella knew that she should quicken her feet, but she could not bring herself to do more than know it. She sought to take into her heart every tiniest detail of that walk, so that in memory she might, years after, walk it again, and so never be quite alone. They passed out through the great iron gates and turned into the lane. Here great elms overhung, and now they walked in darkness, and now again were bathed in light. A twig snapped beneath her foot. Even so small a thing she would remember. "'We must hurry,' she said. "'We are doing all that we can,' replied Dick. "'It's a long way, this walk.' "'You feel it so?' said Stella, tempting him, oh, unwisely. But the spell of the hour and the place was upon her. "'Yes,' he answered her. "'It's a long way in a man's life.' and he drew close to her side. No, she cried with a sudden violence, but she was awake too late. No, Dick, no, she repeated, but his arms were about her. Stella, I want you. Oh, life's dull for a man without a woman, I can tell you, he exclaimed passionately. There are others, plenty, she said, and tried to thrust him away. Not for me, he rejoined, and he would not let her go. Her struggle ceased, she buried her face in his coat, her hands caught his shoulders, she stood trembling and shivering against him. Stella, he whispered, Stella. He raised her face and bent to it, 
Then he straightened himself. Not here, he said. They were standing in the darkness of a tree. He put his arms about her waist and lifted her into an open space where the moonlight shone bright and clear and there were no shadows. Here, he said, and he kissed her on the lips. She thrust her head back, her face uplifted to the skies, her eyes closed. Oh, Dick, she murmured, I meant that this should never be. Even now, you shall forget it. No, I couldn't. So one says, but, oh, it would be your ruin. She started away from him. Listen. Yes, he answered. She stood confronting him desperately a yard or so away, her bosom heaving, her face wet with her tears. Dick Hazelwood did not stir. Stella's lips moved as though she was speaking, but no words were audible, and it seemed that her strength left her. She came suddenly forward, groping with her hands like a blind person. "'Oh, my dear,' she said, as he caught them. They went on again together. She spoke of his father, of the talk of the countryside, but he had an argument for each of hers. "'Be brave just for a little, Stella. Once we are married there will be no trouble.' and with his arms about her she was eager to believe. Stella Ballantyne sat late that night in the armchair in her bedroom, her eyes fixed upon the empty grate in a turmoil of emotion. She grew cold and shivered. A loud noise of birds suddenly burst through the open window. She went to it. The morning had come. She looked across the meadow to the silent house of little beading in the grey, broadening light. All the blinds were down. Were they all asleep, or did one watch like her? She came back to the fireplace. In the grate some torn fragments of a letter caught her eyes. She stooped and picked them up. They were fragments of the letter of regret which she had written earlier that evening. "'I should have sent it,' she whispered. I should not have gone. I should have sent the letter. But the regret was vain. She had gone. Her maid found her in the morning lying upon her bed in a deep sleep and still wearing the dress in which she had gone out. End of chapter 16《Chapter Seventeen and Eighteen of the Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.》Chapter Seventeen Trouble for Mr. Hazelwood. When Dick and Stella walked along the drive to the lane, Harold Hazelwood, who was radiant at the success of his dinner party, turned to Robert Pettifer in the hall. Have a whiskey and soda, Robert, before you go, he said. He led the way back into the library. Behind him walked the Pettifers, Robert ill at ease and wishing himself a hundred miles away, Margaret Pettifer boiling for battle. Hazelwood himself dropped into an armchair. "'I am very glad that you came tonight, Margaret,' he said boldly. "'You have seen for yourself.' "'Yes, I have,' she replied. "'Harold, there have been moments this evening when I could have screamed.' Robert Pettifer hurriedly turned towards the table in the far corner of the room where the tray with the decanters and the siphons had been placed. "'Margaret, I pass my life in a scream at the injustice of the world,' said Harold Hazelwood, and Robert Pettifer chuckled as he cut off the end of a cigar. "'It is strange that an act of reparation should move you in the same way.' "'Reparation!' cried Margaret Pettifer indignantly. Then she noticed that the window was open. She looked around the room. She drew up a chair in front of her brother. "'Harold, if you have no consideration for us, none for your own position, none for the neighbourhood, if you will at all costs force this woman upon us, don't you think that you might still spare a thought for your son?' Robert Pettifer had kept his eyes open that evening, as well as his wife. He took a step down into the room. He was anxious to take no part in the dispute. He desired to be just. He was favourably inclined towards Stella Ballantyne. Looking at her, he had been even a little moved. 
but Dick was the first consideration. He had no children of his own. He cared for Dick as he would have cared for his son, and when he went up each morning by the train to his office in London, there lay at the back of his mind the thought that one day the fortune he was amassing would add a splendour to Dick's career. Harold Hazlewood alone of the three seemed to have his eyes sealed. "'Why, what on earth do you mean, Margaret?' Margaret Pettifer sat down in her chair. "'Where was Dick yesterday afternoon?' "'Margaret, I don't know.' "'I do. I saw him. He was with Stella Ballantyne on the river, in the dusk, in a Canadian canoe.' She uttered each fresh detail in a more indignant tone, as though it aggravated the crime. Yet even so she had not done. There was, it seemed, a culminating offence. She was wearing a white lace frock with a big hat. Well, said Mr. Hazlewood mildly, I don't think I have anything against big hats. She was trailing her hand in the water, that he might notice its slenderness, of course. Outrageous, I call it. Mr. Hazlewood nodded his head at his indignant sister. I know that frame of mind very well, Margaret, he remarked. She cannot do right. If she had been wearing a small hat, she would have been Frenchified. But Mrs. Pettifer was not in a mood for argument. "'Can't you see what it all means?' she cried in exasperation. "'I can, I do,' Mr. Hazelwood retorted, and he smiled proudly upon his sister. "'The boy's better nature is awakening.' Margaret Pettifer lifted up her hands. "'The boy!' she exclaimed. "'He's thirty-four if he's a day.' She leaned forward in her chair, and pointing up to the bay, asked, "'Why is that window open, Harold?' Harold Hazlewood showed his first sign of discomfort. He shifted in his chair. "'It's a hot night, Margaret.' "'That is not the reason,' Mrs. Pettifer retorted implacably. "'Where is Dick?' "'I expect that he is seeing Mrs. Ballantyne home.' exactly said mrs pettifer with a world of significance in her voice mr hazlewood sat up and looked at his sister margaret you want to make me uncomfortable he exclaimed pettishly but you shan't no my dear you shan't he let himself sink back again and joining the tips of his fingers contemplated the ceiling but margaret was in the mind to try she shot out her words at him like so many explosive bullets being friends is one thing, Harold. Marrying is another. Very true, Margaret, very true. They are in love with one another. Rubbish, Margaret, rubbish. I watched them at the dinner table and afterwards. They are man and woman, Harold. That's what you don't understand. They are not illustrations of your theories. Ask Robert. No, exclaimed Robert Pettifer. He hurriedly lit a cigar. Any inference I should make must be purely hypothetical. Yes, we'll ask Robert. Come, Pettifer, said Mr. Hazlewood, let us have your opinion. Robert Pettifer came reluctantly down from his corner. Well, if you insist, I think they were very friendly. Ah, cried Hazlewood in triumph. Being friends is one thing, Margaret, marrying is another. Mrs. Pettifer shook her head over her brother with a most aggravating pity. "'Dick said a shrewd thing the other day to me, Harold.' Mr. Hazlewood looked doubtfully at his sister. "'I am sure of it,' he answered, but he was careful not to ask for any repetition of the shrewd remark. Margaret, however, was not in the mind to let him off. He said that sentimental philosophers sooner or later break their heads against their own theories. Mark those words, Harold. I hope they won't come true of you. I hope so very much indeed. But it was abundantly clear that she had not a shadow of doubt that they would come true. Mr. Hazlewood was stung by the slighting phrase. I am not a sentimental philosopher, he said hotly. Sentiment I altogether abhor. I hold strong views, I admit. You do indeed, his sister interrupted with an ironical laugh. Oh, I have read your pamphlet, Harold. 
the prison walls must cast no shadow and convicts once they are released have as much right to sit down at our dinner tables as they had before well you carry your principles into practice that i will say we had an illustration to-night you are unjust margaret and mr hazlewood rose from his chair with some dignity you speak of mrs ballantyne not for the first time as if she had been tried and condemned in fact she was tried and acquitted and in his turn he appealed to pettifer ask robert he said but pettifer was slow to answer and when he did it was without assurance yes he replied with something of a drawl undoubtedly mrs ballantyne was tried and acquitted and he left the impression on the two who heard him that with acquittal quite the last word had not been said mrs pettifer looked at him eagerly she drew clear at once of the dispute she left the questions now to harold hazlewood and pettifer had spoken with so much hesitation that harold hazlewood could not but ask them you are making reservations robert pettifer shrugged his shoulders i think we have a right to know them hazlewood insisted you are a solicitor with a great business and consequently a wide experience not of criminal cases hazlewood i bring no more authority to judge them than any other man still you have formed an opinion please let me have it and mr hazlewood sat down again and crossed his knees but a little impatience was now audible in his voice an opinion is too strong a word replied pettifer guardedly the trial took place nearly eighteen months ago i read the accounts of it certainly day by day as i travelled in the train to london but they were summaries full summaries robert said hazlewood no doubt the trial made a great deal of noise in the world but they were not full enough for me even if my memory of those newspaper reports were clear i should still hesitate to sit in judgment but my memory isn't clear let us see what i do remember pettifer took a chair and sat for a few moments with his forehead wrinkled in a frown was he really trying to remember his wife asked herself that question as she watched him or had he something to tell them which he meant to let fall in his own cautiously careless way mrs pettifer listened alertly the well let us call it the catastrophe took place in a tent in some state of rajputana yes said mr hazlewood it took place at night mrs ballantyne was asleep in her bed the man ballantyne was found outside the tent in the doorway yes pettifer paused so many law cases have engaged my attention since he said in apology for his hesitation he seemed quite at a loss then he went on wait a moment a man had been dining with them at night oh yes i begin to remember harold hazlewood made a tiny movement and would have spoken but margaret held out a hand towards him swiftly yes a man called thresk said pettifer and again he was silent well asked hazlewood well that's all i remember replied pettifer briskly he rose and put his chair back except he added slowly yes except that there was left upon my mind when the verdict was published a vague feeling of doubt there cried mrs pettifer triumphantly you hear him harold but hazlewood paid no attention to her he was gazing at his brother-in-law with a good deal of uneasiness why he asked why were you in doubt robert but pettifer had said all that he had any mind to say oh i can't remember why he exclaimed i am very likely quite wrong come margaret it's time that we were getting home he crossed over to hazlewood and held out his hand hazlewood however did not rise i don't think that's quite fair of you robert he said you don't disturb my confidence of course i have gone into the case thoroughly but i think you ought to give me a chance of satisfying you that your doubts have no justification no really exclaimed pettifer i absolutely refuse to mix myself up in the affair at all a step sounded upon the gravel path outside the window 
Pettifer raised a warning finger. "'It's midnight, Margaret,' he said. "'We must go.' And as he spoke, Dick Hazlewood walked in through the open window. He smiled at the group of his relations with a grim amusement. They certainly wore a guilty look. He was surprised to remark some embarrassment even upon his father's face. "'You will see your aunt off, Richard,' said Mr. Hazlewood. "'Of course.' The Pettifers and Dick went out into the hall, leaving the old man in his chair, a little absent, perhaps a little troubled. "'Aunt Margaret, you have been upsetting my father,' said Dick. "'Nonsense, Dick,' she replied, and her face flushed. She stepped into the carriage quickly to avoid questions, and as she stepped in, Dick noticed that she was carrying a little paper-covered book. Pettifer followed. "'Good night, Dick,' he said and he shook hands with his nephew very warmly. In spite of his cordiality, however, Dick's face grew hard as he watched the carriage drive away. Stella was right. The Pettifers were the enemy. Well, he had always known there would be a fight, and now the sooner it came, the better. He went back to the library, and as he opened the door, he heard his father's voice. The old man was sitting sunk in his chair, and repeating to himself, I won't believe it. I won't believe it. He stopped at once when Dick came in. Dick looked at him with concern. You are tired, father, he said. Yes, I think I am a little. I'll go to bed. Hazlewood watched Dick walk over to the corner table where the candle stood beside the tray, and his face cleared. For the first time in his life the tidy, well-groomed, conventional look of his son was a real pleasure to him. Richard was one of those to whom the good will of the world meant much. He would never throw it lightly away. Hazelwood got up and took one of the candles from his son. He patted him on the shoulder. He became quite at ease as he looked into his face. "'Good night, my boy,' he said. "'Good night, sir,' replied Dick cheerfully. "'There's nothing like acting up to one's theories, is there?' "'Nothing,' said the old man heartily. "'Look at my life.' Yes, replied Dick, and now look at mine. I am going to marry Stella Ballantyne. For a moment Mr. Hazelwood stood perfectly still. Then he murmured lamely, Oh, are you? Are you, Richard? And he shuffled quickly out of the room. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 Mr. Hazelwood Seeks Advice as Dick was getting out of bed at half-past seven, a troubled little note was brought to him, written hurriedly and almost incoherent. "'Dick, I can't ride with you this morning. I am too tired, and I don't think we should meet again. You must forget last night. I shall be very proud always to remember it, but I won't ruin you, Dick. You mustn't think I shall suffer so very much.' Dick read it all through with a smile of tenderness upon his face. He wrote a line in reply. I will come and see you at eleven, Stella. Meanwhile, sleep, my dear, and sent it across to the cottage. Then he rolled back into bed again and took his own advice. It was late when he came down into the dining room, and he took his breakfast alone. Where's my father? he asked of Hubbard, the butler. Mr. Hazlewood breakfasted half an hour ago, sir. He's at work now. Capital, said Dick. Give me some sausages. Hubbard, what would you say if I told you that I was going to be married? Hubbard placed a plate in front of him. I should keep my head, sir, he answered in his gentle voice. Will you take tea? Thank you. Dick looked out of the window. It was a morning of clear skies and sunlight, a very proper morning for this, the first of all the remarkable days, which one after the other were going especially to belong to him. He was of the gods now. The world was his property, or rather he held it in trust for Stella. It was behaving well. Dick Hazelwood was contented. He ate a large breakfast, and strolling into the library lit his pipe. There was his father bending over his papers at his writing-table before the window, busy as a bee, no doubt, at some new enthusiasm which was destined to infuriate his neighbours. Let him go on. Dick smiled benignly at the old man's back. 
Then he frowned. It was curious that his father had not wished him a good morning. Curious and unusual. "'I hope, sir, that you slept well,' he said. "'I did not, Richard,' and still the back was turned to him. "'I lay awake considering with some care what you told me last night about... about Stella Ballantyne.' Of late she had been simply Stella to Harold Hazelwood. The addition of Ballantyne was significant. It replaced friendliness with formality. "'Yes, we agreed to champion her cause, didn't we?' said Dick cheerily. "'You took one good step forward last night. I took another.' "'You took a long stride, Richard, and I think you might have consulted me first. Dick walked over to the table at which his father sat. "'Do you know, that's just what Stella said,' he remarked, and he seemed to find the suggestion rather unintelligible. Mr. Hazelwood snatched at any support which was offered to him. "'Ah!' he exclaimed, and for the first time that morning he looked his son in the face. "'There now, Richard, you see?' "'Yes,' Richard returned imperturbably, "'but I was able to remove all her fears.' I was able to tell her that you would welcome our marriage with all your heart, for you would look upon it as a triumph for your principles, and a sure sign that my better nature was at last thoroughly awake. Dick walked away from the table. The old man's face lengthened. If he was a philosopher at all, he was a philosopher in a piteous position, for he was having his theories tested upon himself. He was to be the experiment by which they should be proved or disproved. No doubt, he said, in a lamentable voice. Quite so, Richard. Yes. And he caught at vague hopes of delay. There's no hurry, of course. For one thing, I don't want to lose you. And then you have your career to think of, haven't you? Mr. Hazelwood found himself here upon ground more solid and leaned his weight on it. Yes, there's your career. Dick returned to his father, amazement upon his face. He spoke as one who cannot believe the evidence of his ears. "'But it's in the army, father. Do you realize what you're saying? You want me to think of my career in the British army?' Consistency, however, had no charms for Mr. Hazelwood at this moment. "'Exactly,' he cried. "'We don't want to prejudice that, do we? No, no, Richard.' Oh, I hear the finest things about you. And they push the young men along nowadays. You don't have to wait for grey hairs before you're made a general, Richard. So we must keep an eye on our prospects, eh? And for that reason it would be advisable, perhaps... And the old man's eyes fell from Dick's face to his papers. Yes, it would certainly be advisable to let your engagement remain for a while, just a private matter between the three of us. He took up his pen as though the matter was decided, and discussion at an end. But Dick did not move from his side. He was the stronger of the two, and in a little while the old man's eyes wandered up to his face again. There was a look there which Margaret Pettifer had seen a week ago. Dick spoke, and the voice he used was strange and formidable to his father. Uh, "'There must be no secrecy, father. I remember what you said for uncharitable slander an English village is impossible to beat. Our secret would be known within a week, and by attempting to keep it we invite suspicion. Nothing could be more damaging to Stella than secrecy. Consequently, nothing could be more damaging to me. I don't deny that things are going to be a little difficult, but of this I am sure. And his voice, though it still was quiet, rang deep with confidence. Our one chance is to hold our heads high. No secrecy, father. My hope is to make a life which has been very troubled know some comfort and a little happiness. Mr. Hazelwood had no more to say. He must renounce his gods or hold his tongue. And renounce his gods, no, that he could not do. He heard in imagination the whole neighborhood laughing. He saw it a sea of laughter overwhelming him. He shivered as he thought of it. He, Harold Hazelwood, the man emancipated from the fictions of society, caught like a silly struggling fish in the net of his own theories. No, that must never be. He flung himself at his work. 
he was revising the catalogue of his miniatures and in a minute he began to fumble and search about his overloaded desk everybody is trying to thwart me this morning he cried angrily what's the matter father asked dick laying down the times can i help i wrote a question to notes and queries about the marie antoinette miniature which i bought at lord merlinton's sale and there was an answer in the last number a very complete answer but i can't find it i can't find it anywhere and he tossed his papers about as though he were punishing them dick helped in the search but beyond a stray copy or two of the prison walls must cast no shadow there was no publication to be found at all wait a bit father said dick suddenly what is notes and queries like the only notes and queries i read are contained in a pink paper they are very amusing but they do not deal with miniatures mr hazelwood described the appearance of the little magazine well that's very extraordinary said dick for aunt margaret took it away last night mr hazelwood looked at his son in blank astonishment are you sure richard i saw it in her hand as she stepped into her carriage mr hazelwood banged his fist upon the table it's extremely annoying of margaret he exclaimed she takes no interest in such matters she is not if i may use the word a virtuoso she did it solely to annoy me well i wonder said dick he looked at his watch it was eleven o'clock he went out into the hall picked up a straw hat and walked across the meadow to the thatched cottage on the river bank but while he went he was still wondering why in the world margaret had taken away that harmless little magazine from his father's writing-table pettifer's at the bottom of it he concluded there's a foxy fellow for you i'll keep my eye on uncle robert he was near to the cottage only a rail separated its garden from the meadow beyond the garden a window stood open and within the room he saw the flutter of a lilac dress from the window of the library mr hazelwood watched his son open the garden gate then he unlocked a drawer of his writing-table and took out a large sealed envelope he broke the seal and drew from the envelope a sheaf of press cuttings they were the verbatim reports of stella ballantyne's trial which had been printed day by day in the times of india he had sent for them months ago when he had blithely taken upon himself the defence of stella ballantyne he had read them with a growing ardour so harshly had she lived so shadowless was her innocence he turned to them now in a different spirit pettifer had been left by the english summaries of the trial with a vague feeling of doubt mr hazelwood respected robert pettifer the lawyer was cautious deliberate unemotional qualities with which hazelwood had instinctively little sympathy but on the other hand he was not bound hand and foot in prejudice he could be liberal in his judgments he had a mind clear enough to divide what reason had to say and the presumptions of convention suppose that pettifer was after all right the old man's heart sank within him then indeed this marriage must be prevented and the truth must be made known yes widely known he himself had been deceived like many another man before him it was not ridiculous to have been deceived he remained at all events consistent to his principles there was his pamphlet to be sure the prison walls must cast no shadow that gave him an uncomfortable twinge but he reassured himself there i argue that once the offence has been expiated all the principles should be restored but if pettifer is right there has been no expiation that saving clause let him out he did not thus phrase the position even to himself he clothed it in other and high-sounding words it was after all a sort of convention to accept acquittal as the proof of innocence but at the back of his mind from first to last there was an immense fear of the figure which he himself would cut if he refused his consent to the marriage on any ground except that of stella ballantyne's guilt for stella herself the woman 
he had no kindness to spare that morning yesterday he had overflowed with it for yesterday she had been one more proof to the world how high he soared about it since pettifer's in doubt he said to himself there must be some flaw in this trial which i overlooked in the heat of my sympathy and to discover that flaw he read again every printed detail of it from the morning when stella first appeared before the stipendiary magistrate to that other morning a month later when the verdict was given and he found no flaw stella's acquittal was inevitable on the evidence there was much to show what provocation she had suffered but there was no proof that she had yielded to it on the contrary she had endured so long the presumption must be that she would go on enduring to the end and there was other evidence positive evidence given by thresk which could not be gainsaid mr hazlewood replaced his cuttings in the drawer and he was utterly discontented he had hoped for another result there was only one point which puzzled him and that had nothing really to do with the trial but it puzzled him so much that it slipped out at luncheon richard he said i cannot understand why the name of thresk is so familiar to me dick glanced quickly at his father you have been reading over again the accounts of the trial mr hazlewood looked confused and a very natural proceeding richard he declared but while reading over the trial i found the name thresk familiar to me in another connection but i cannot remember what the connection is dick could not help him nor was he at that time concerned by the failure of his father's memory he was engaged in realizing that here was another enemy for stella knowing his father he was not greatly surprised but he thought it prudent to attack without delay stella will be coming over to tea this afternoon he said will she richard the father replied twisting uncomfortably in his chair very well of course hubbard knows of my engagement by the way dick continued implacably hubbard god bless my soul cried the old man it'll be all over the village already i shouldn't wonder replied dick cheerfully i told him before i saw you this morning whilst i was having breakfast mr hazlewood remained silent for a while then he burst out petulantly richard there's something i must speak to you seriously about the lateness of your hours in the morning i have noticed it with great regret it is not considerate to the servants and it cannot be healthy for you such indolence too must be enervating to your mind dick forbore to remind his father that he was usually out of the house before seven father he said at once a very model of humility i will endeavour to reform mr hazlewood concealed his embarrassment at tea-time under a show of overwork he had a great deal to do just a moment for a cup of tea no more there was to be a meeting of the county council the next morning when a most important question of small holdings was to come up for discussion mr hazlewood held the strongest views he was engaged in shaping them in the smallest possible number of words to be brief to be vivid there was the whole art of public speaking mr hazlewood chattered feverishly for five minutes he had come in chattering he went out chattering that's all right stella you see said dick cheerfully when they were left alone stella nodded her head mr hazlewood had not said one word in recognition of her engagement but she had made her little fight that morning she had yielded and she could not renew it she had spent three miserable hours framing reasonable arguments why last night should be forgotten but the sight of her lover coming across the meadow had set her heart so leaping that she could only stammer out a few tags and phrases oh i wish you hadn't come she had repeated and repeated all the while while her blood was leaping in her body for joy that he had she had promised in the end to stand firm to stand by his side and brave what after all but the clamour of a week so he put it and so she was eager to believe mr hazlewood busy though he made himself out to be found time that evening to drive in his motor-car into great beading 
and when the london train pulled up at the station he was on the platform he looked anxiously at the passengers who descended until he saw robert pettifer he went up to him at once what in the world are you doing here asked the lawyer i came on purpose to catch you robert i want to speak to you in private my car is here if you will get into it with me we can drive slowly towards your house pettifer's face changed but he could not refuse hazlewood was agitated and nervous of his ordinary complacency there was no longer a trace pettifer got into the car and as it moved away from the station he asked now what's the matter i have been thinking over what you said last night robert you had a vague feeling of doubt well i have the verbatim reports of the trial in bombay here in this envelope and i want you to read them carefully through and give me your opinion he held out the envelope as he spoke but pettifer thrust his hands into his pockets i won't touch it he declared i refuse to mix myself up in the affair at all i said more than i meant to last night but you did say it robert then i withdraw it now but you can't robert you must go further something has happened to-day something very serious oh said pettifer yes replied mr hazlewood margaret really has more insight than i credit her with they propose to get married pettifer sat upright in the car you mean dick and stella ballantyne yes and for a little while there was silence in the car then mr hazlewood continued to bleat i never suspected anything of the kind it places me robert in a very difficult position i can quite see that answered pettifer with a grim smile it's really the only consoling element in the whole business you can't refuse your consent without looking a fool and you can't give it while you're in any doubt as to mrs ballantyne's innocence mr hazlewood was not however quite prepared to accept that definition of his position you don't exhaust the possibilities robert he said i can quite well refuse my consent and publicly refuse it if there are reasonable grounds for believing that there was in that trial a grave miscarriage of justice mr pettifer looked sharply at his companion the voice no less than the words fixed his attention this was not the mr hazlewood of yesterday the champion had dwindled into a figure of meanness harold hazlewood would be glad to discover those reasonable grounds and he would be very much obliged if robert pettifer would take upon himself the responsibility of discovering them yes i see said pettifer slowly he was half inclined to leave harold hazlewood to find his way out of his trouble by himself it was all his making after all but other and wider considerations began to press upon pettifer he forced himself to omit altogether the subject of hazlewood's vanities and entanglements very well give the cuttings to me i will read them through and i will let you know my opinion their intention to marry may alter everything my point of view as much as yours mr pettifer took the envelope in his hand and got out of the car as soon as hazlewood had stopped it you have raised no objections to the engagement he asked a word to richard this morning of not much effect i'm afraid mr pettifer nodded right i should say nothing to anybody you can't take a decided line against it at present and to snarl it would be the worst policy imaginable today's thursday we'll meet on saturday good night and robert pettifer walked away to his own house he walked slowly, wondering at the eternal mystery by which this particular man and that individual woman select each other out of the throng. He owed the greater part of his fortune to the mystery, like many another lawyer, but to-night he would willingly have yielded a good portion of it up if that process of selection could be ordered in a more reasonable way. Love? The attraction of sex? Yes, no doubt but why these two specimens of sex why dick and stella ballantyne when he reached his house his wife hurried forward to meet him already she had the news there was an excitement in her face not to be misunderstood 
the futile time-honoured phrase of triumph so ready on the lips of those who have prophesied evil was trembling upon hers don't say it margaret said pettifer very seriously we have come to a pass where light words will lead us astray hazelwood has been with me i have the reports of the trial here margaret pettifer put a check upon her tongue and they dined together almost in complete silence pettifer was methodically getting his own point of view quite clearly established in his mind so that whatever he did or advised he might be certain not to swerve from it afterwards he weighed his inclinations and his hopes and when the servants had left the dining-room and he had lit his cigar he put his case before his wife listen margaret you know your brother he is always in extremes he swings from one to the other he is terrified now lest this marriage should take place no wonder interposed mrs pettifer pettifer made no comment upon the remark therefore he continued he is anxious that i should discover in these reports some solid reason for believing that the verdict which acquitted stella ballantyne was a grave miscarriage of justice for any such reason must have weight of course said mrs pettifer and will justify him this is his chief consideration in withholding publicly his consent i see only a week ago dick himself had observed that sentimental philosophers had a knack of breaking their heads against their own theories the words had been justified sooner than she had expected mrs pettifer was not surprised at harold hazlewood's swift change any more than her husband had been harold to her thinking was a sentimentalist and sentimentality was like a fir tree a thing of no deep roots and easily torn up but i do not take that view margaret continued her husband and she looked at him with consternation was he now to turn champion he who only yesterday had doubted and i want you to consider whether you can agree with me there is to begin with the woman herself stella ballantyne i saw her for the first time yesterday and to be quite honest i liked her margaret yes it seemed to me that there was nothing whatever of the adventurous about her and i was impressed i will go further i was moved dry as dust old lawyer as i am by something how shall i express it without being ridiculous he paused and searched in his vocabulary and gave up the search no the epithet which occurred to me yesterday at the dinner-table and immediately still seems to me the only true one i was moved by something in this woman of tragic experiences which was strangely virginal one quick movement was made by margaret pettifer the truth of her husband's description was a revelation so exact it was therein lay stella ballantyne's charm and her power to create champions and friends her history was known to you the miseries of her marriage the suspicion of crime you expected a woman of adventures and lo there stood before you one with something virginal in her appearance and her manner which made its soft and irresistible appeal i recognize that feeling of mine pettifer resumed and i try to put it aside and putting it aside i ask myself and you margaret this here is a woman who has been through a pretty bad time who has been unhappy who has stood in the dock who has been acquitted is it quite fair that when at last she has floated into a haven of peace two private people like hazlewood and myself should take it upon ourselves to review the verdict and perhaps reverse it but there's dick robert cried mrs pettifer there's dick surely he's our first thought yes there's dick mr pettifer repeated and dick's my second point you are all worrying about dick from the social point of view the external point of view well we have got to take that into our consideration but we are bound to look at him the man as well don't forget that margaret well i find the two points of view identical but our neighbours won't will you mrs pettifer was baffled i don't understand she said i'll explain 
from the social standpoint what's really important as regards dick that he should go out to dinner no that he should have children yes and here mrs pettifer interposed again but they must be the right children she exclaimed better that he should have none than that he should have children with an hereditary taint pettifer agreed admitted margaret if we come to the conclusion that stella ballantyne did what she was accused of doing we in spite of all the verdicts in the world are bound to resist this marriage i grant it because of that conviction i dismiss the plea that we are unfair to the woman in reviewing the trial there are wider greater considerations these were the first words of comfort which mrs pettifer had heard since her husband began to expound she received them with enthusiasm i am so glad to hear that yes margaret pettifer retorted dryly but please ask yourself this question it is where to my thinking the social and the personal elements join if this marriage is broken off is dick likely to marry at all why not asked margaret he is thirty-four he has had no doubt many opportunities of marriage he must have had he is good-looking well off and a good fellow this is the first time he has wanted to marry if he is disappointed here will he try again mrs pettifer laughed moved by the remarkable depreciation of her own sex which women of her type so often have it was for man to throw the handkerchief not a doubt but there would be a rush to pick it up widowers who have been devoted to their wives marry again she argued a point for me margaret returned pettifer widowers yes they miss so much the habit of a house with a woman its mistress the companionship the order oh a thousand small but important things but a man who has remained a bachelor until he's thirty-four that's a different case if he sets his heart at that age seriously for the first time on a woman and does not get her that's the kind of man who my experience suggests to me i put it plainly margaret will take one or more mistresses to himself but no wife mrs pettifer deferred to the worldly knowledge of her husband but she clung to her one clear argument nothing could be worse she said frankly than that he should marry a guilty woman granted margaret replied mr pettifer imperturbably only suppose that she's not guilty there are you and i rich people and no one to leave our money to no one to carry on your name no one we care a rap about to benefit by my work and your brother's fortune no one of the family to hand over little beading to both of them were silent after he had spoken he had touched upon their one great sorrow margaret herself had her roots deep in the soil of little beading it was hateful to her that the treasured house should ever pass to strangers as it would do if this last branch of the family failed but stella ballantyne was married for seven years she said at last and there were no children no that's true replied pettifer but it does not follow that with a second marriage there will be none it's a chance i know but and he got up from his chair i do honestly believe that it's the only chance you and i will have margaret of dying with the knowledge that our lives have not been altogether vain we've lighted our little torch yes and it burns merrily enough but what's the use unless at the appointed milestone there's another of us to take it and carry it on he stood looking down at his wife with a wistful and serious look upon his face dick's past the age of calf love we can't expect him to tumble from one passion to another and he's not easily moved therefore i hope very sincerely that these reports which i am now going to read will enable me to go boldly to harold hazlewood and say stella ballantyne is as guiltless of this crime as you or i mr pettifer took up the big envelope which he had placed on the table beside him and carried it away to his study. End of chapter 18
Chapters 19, 20, and 21 of The Witness for the Defense by A. E. W. Mason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Pettifer's Plan. On the Saturday morning, Mr. Hazelwood drove over early to Great Beading. His impatience had so grown during the last few days that his very sleep was broken at night, and in the daytime he could not keep still. The news of Dick's engagement to Stella Ballantyne was now known throughout the countryside, and the blame for it was laid upon Harold Hazelwood's shoulders. For blame was the general note, blame and chagrin. A few bold and kindly spirits went at once to see Stella. A good many more seriously, and at great length, debated over their tea-tables whether they should call after the marriage. But on the whole the verdict was an indignant no. Disgrace was being brought upon the neighbourhood. Little beating would be impossible. Dick Hazelwood only laughed at the constraint of his acquaintances, and when three of them crossed the road hurriedly in great beating, to avoid Stella and himself, he said, good-humouredly, "'They are like an ill-trained company of bad soldiers. Let one of them break from the ranks, and they'll all stream away so as not to be left behind. You'll see, Stella.' One of them will come, and the rest will tumble over one another to get into your drawing-room. How much he believed or what he said, Stella did not inquire. She had a gift of silence. She just walked a little nearer to him and smiled, lest any should think that she had noticed the slight. The one man, in a word, who showed signs of wear and tear was Mr. Hazelwood himself. So keen was his distress that he had no fear of his sister's sarcasms. I think of it, he exclaimed, in a piteous bewilderment. Actually, I have become sensitive to public opinion. And Mrs. Pettifer forbore from the comments which she very much longed to make. She was in the study when Harold Hazelwood was shown in, and Pettifer had bidden her to stay. Margaret knows that I have been reading these reports, he said. Sit down, Hazelwood, and I'll tell you what I think. Mr. Hazelwood took a seat facing the garden with its old red-brick wall, on which a purple clematis was growing. "'You have formed an opinion, then, Robert?' "'One. What is it?' he asked eagerly. Robert Pettifer clapped the palm of his hand down upon the cuttings from the newspapers which lay before him on the desk. "'This. No other verdict could possibly have been given by the jury.' On the evidence produced at the trial in Bombay, Mrs. Ballantyne was properly and inevitably acquitted. Robert! exclaimed his wife. She, too, had been hoping for the contrary opinion. As for Hazelwood himself, the sunlight seemed to die off that garden. He drew his hand across his forehead. He half rose to go when again Robert Pettifer spoke. And yet, he said slowly, I am not satisfied. Harold Hazelwood sat down again. Mrs. Pettifer drew a breath of relief. The chief witness for the defence, the witness whose evidence made the acquittal certain, was a man I know, a barrister called Thresk. Yes, interrupted Hazelwood, I have been puzzled about that man ever since you mentioned him before. His name I am somehow familiar with. I'll explain that to you in a minute, said Pettifer and his wife leaned forward suddenly in her chair. She did not interrupt, but she sat with a look of keen expectancy upon her face. She did not know whither Pettifer was leading them, but she was now sure that it was to some carefully pondered goal. "'I have more than once briefed Thresk myself. He's a man of the highest reputation at the bar, straightforward, honest. He enjoys a great practice. He is in Parliament with a great future in Parliament.' In a word, he is a man with everything to lose if he lied as a witness in a trial. And yet, I am not satisfied. Mr. Pettifer's voice sank to a low murmur. He sat at his desk, staring out in front of him through the window. Why? asked Hazelwood. But Pettifer did not answer him. He seemed not to hear the question. He went on in the low, quiet voice he had used before rather like one talking to himself than to a companion. "'I should very much like to put a question or two to Mr. Thresk. 
then why don't you exclaimed mrs pettifer you know him yes mr hazlewood eagerly seconded his sister since you know him you are the very man pettifer shook his head it would be an impertinence for although i look upon dick as a son i am not his father you are hazlewood you are he wouldn't answer me would he answer me asked hazlewood i don't know him at all i can't go to him and ask if he told the truth no no you can't do that pettifer answered nor do i mean you to i want to put my questions myself in my own way and i thought that you might get him down to little beading but i have no excuse cried hazlewood and mrs pettifer at last understood the plan which was in her husband's mind which had been growing to completion since the night when he had dined at little beading yes you have an excuse she cried and pettifer explained what it was you collect miniatures some time ago you bought one of marie antoinette at lord merlitton's sale you asked a question as to its authenticity in notes and queries it was answered mr hazlewood broke in excitedly by a man called thresk that is why the name was familiar to me but i could not remember he turned upon his sister it's your fault margaret you took my copy of notes and queries away with you dick noticed it and told me dick pettifer exclaimed in alarm but the alarm passed he cannot have guessed why mrs pettifer was clear upon the point no i took the magazine because of a remark which robert made to you dick did not hear it no he cannot have guessed why for it's important that he should have no suspicion whatever of what i propose that you should do hazlewood pettifer said gravely i propose that we should take a lesson from the legal processes of another country it may work it may not but to my mind it is our only chance let me hear said hazlewood thresk is an authority on old silver and miniatures he has a valuable collection himself his advice is sought by people in the trade you know what collectors are get him down to see your collection it wouldn't be the first time that you've invited a stranger to pass a night in your house for that purpose would it no and the invitation has often been accepted well sometimes we must hope that it will be this time get thresk down to little beading upon that excuse then confront him unexpectedly with mrs ballantyne and let me be there such was the plan which pettifer suggested a period of silence followed upon his words even mr hazlewood in the extremity of his distress recoiled from it it would look like a trap mr pettifer thumped his table impatiently let's be frank for heaven's sake it wouldn't merely look like a trap it would be one it wouldn't be at all a pretty thing to do but there's this marriage no i couldn't do it said hazlewood very well there's no more to be said pettifer himself had no liking for the plan it had been his intention originally to let hazlewood know that if he wished to get into communication with thresk there was a means by which he could do it but the fact of dick's engagement had carried him still further and now that he had read the evidence of the trial carefully there was a real anxiety in his mind pettifer sealed up the cuttings in a fresh envelope and gave them to hazlewood and went out with them to the door of course said the old man if your legal experience robert leads you to think that we should be justified but it doesn't pettifer was quick to interpose he recognized his brother's-in-law intention to throw the discredit of the trick upon his shoulders but he would have none of it no hazlewood he said cheerfully it's not a plan which a high-class lawyer would be likely to commend to a client then i am afraid that i couldn't do it all right said pettifer with his hand upon the latch of the door thresk's chambers are in king's bench walk he added the number i simply couldn't think of it hazlewood repeated as he crossed the pavement to his car perhaps not said pettifer you have the envelope yes 
Choose an evening towards the end of the week. A Friday will be your best chance of getting him. I will do nothing of the kind, Pettifer. And let me know when he is coming. Good-bye. The car carried Mr. Hazlewood away, still protesting that he really couldn't think of it for an instant. But he thought a good deal of it during the next week, and his temper did not improve. Pettifer has rubbed off the finer edges of his nature, he said to himself. It is a pity, a great pity, but thirty years of life in a lawyer's office must no doubt have that effect. I regret very much that Pettifer should have imagined that I would condescend to such a scheme. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 On the Downs they went up by the steep chalk road which skirts the park wall to the top of the conical hill above the race-course. An escarpment of grass-banks guards a hollow like a shallow crater on the very summit. They rode round it upon the rim, now facing the black slope of Charlton Forest across the valley to the north, now looking out over the plain and Chichester. Thirty miles away, above the sea, the chalk cliffs of the Isle of Wight gleamed under their thatch of dark turf. It was not yet nine in the morning. Later the day would climb dustily to noon. Now it had the wonder and the stillness of great beginnings. A faint haze like a veil at the edges of the sky, and a freshness of the air made the world magical to these two who rode high above the weald and sea. Stella looked downwards to the silver flash of the broad waters west of Chichester Spire. "'That way they came, perhaps on a day like this,' she said slowly, "'those old centurions.' "'Your thoughts go back,' said Dick Hazlewood, with a laugh. "'Not so far as you think,' cried Stella, and suddenly her cheeks took fire and a smile dimpled them. "'Oh, I dare to think of many things to-day.' She rode down the steep grass slope towards the race-course with Dick at her side, it was the first morning they had ridden together since the night of the dinner-party at Little Beeding. Mr. Hazlewood was at this moment ordering his car, so that he might drive to the town and learn what Pettifer had discovered in the cuttings from the newspapers. But they were quite unaware of the plot which was being hatched against them. They went forward under the high beech-trees, watching for the great roots which stretched across their path, and talking little. An open way between wooden posts led them now onto turf and gave them the freedom of the downs. They saw no one. With the larks and the field fairs they had the world to themselves, and in the shade beneath the hedges the dew still sparkled on the grass. They left the long arm of Holnacre down upon their right, its old mill standing up on the edge like some lighthouse on a bluff of the sea, and crossing the high road from up Waltham, rode along a narrow glade amongst beeches and nut-trees and small oaks and bushes of wild roses. Open spaces came again, below them were the woods and the green country of Slindon and the deep grass of Dale Park. And so they drew near to Gumber Corner, where Stane Street climbs over Bignor Hill. Here Dick Hazlewood halted. I suppose we turn. Not to-day, said Stella, and Dick turned to her with surprise. Always before they had stopped at this point, and always by Stella's wish. Either she was tired, or was needed at home, or had letters to write. Always there had been some excuse, and no reason. Dick Hazlewood had come to believe that she would not pass this point, that the downland beyond was a sort of Tom Tiddler's ground on which she would not trespass. He had wondered why, but his instinct had warned him from questions. He had always turned to this spot immediately, as if he believed the excuse which she had ready. Stella noticed the surprise upon his face, and the blushes rose again in her cheeks. "'You knew that I would not go beyond,' she said. "'Yes.' "'But you did not know why.' there was a note of urgency in her voice. "'I guessed,' he said. "'I mean, I played with guesses. Oh, not seriously,' and he laughed. "'There runs Stane Street from Chichester to London, and through London to the Great North Wall. 
up that road the romans marched and back by that road they returned to their galleys in the water there by chichester i pictured you living in those days a boadicea of the weald who would set her heart against her will on some dashing captain of old rome camped here on the top of bignor hill you crept from your own people at night to meet him in the lane at the bottom then came week after week when the street rang with the tramp of soldiers returning from london and lichfield in the north to embark in their boats for gaul and rome they took my captain with them cried stella laughing with them at the conceit yes so my fable ran he pined for the circus and the theatre and the painted ladies so he went willingly the brute cried stella and so i broke my heart over a decadent philanderer in a suit of bright brass clothes and remember it thirteen hundred years afterwards in another life thank you captain hazlewood no you don't actually remember it stella but you have a feeling that round about stane street you once suffered great humiliation and unhappiness and suddenly stella rode swiftly past him but in a moment she waited for him and showed him a face of smiles you see i have crossed stane street to-day dick she said we'll ride on to arundel yes answered dick my story won't do and he remembered a sentence of hers spoken an hour and a half ago my thoughts do not go back as far as you think at all events she was emancipated to-day for they rode on until at the end of a long gentle slope the great arch of the gate into arundel park gleamed white in a line of tall dark trees end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one the letter is written but stella's confidence did not live long mr hazlewood was a child at deceptions and day by day his anxieties increased his friends argued with him his folly and weakness were the themes and he must needs repel the argument though his thoughts echoed every word they used never was a man brought to such a piteous depth of misery by the practice of his own theories he sat by the hour at his desk burying his face amongst his papers if dick came into the room with a great show of occupation he could hardly bear to contemplate the marriage of his son yet day and night he must think of it and search for expedients which might put an end to the trouble and let him walk free again with his head raised high but there were only the two expedients he must speak out his fears that justice had miscarried and that device his vanity forbade or he must adopt pettifer's suggestion and from that he shrank almost as much he began to resent the presence of stella ballantyne and he showed it sometimes a friendliness so excessive that it was almost hysterical betrayed him more usually a discomfort and constraint he avoided her if by any means he could if he could not quite avoid her an excuse of business was always on his lips your father hates me dick she said he was my friend until i touched his own life then i was in the black books in a second dick would not hear of it you were never in the black books at all stella he said comforting her as well as he could we knew that there would be a little struggle didn't we but the worst of that's over you make friends daily not with your father dick i go back with him ever since that night it's three weeks ago now when you took me home from little beading no cried dick but stella nodded her head gloomily mr pettifer dined here that night he's an enemy of mine stella young hazlewood remonstrated you see enemies everywhere and upon that stella broke out with a quivering troubled face is it wonderful oh dick i couldn't lose you a month ago before that night yes nothing had been said but now i couldn't i couldn't i have often thought it would be better for me to go right away and never see you again and and i have tried to tell you something dick ever so many times yes said dick he slipped his arm through hers and held her close to him as though to give her courage and security yes stella and he stood very still i mean she said looking down upon the ground that i have tried to tell you that i wouldn't suffer so very much if we did part but i never could do it my lips shook so i could never speak the words 
Then her voice ran up into a laugh. To think of your living in a house with somebody else, oh no! You need have no fear of that, Stella. They were in the garden of Little Beeding, and they walked across the meadow towards her cottage, talking very earnestly. Mr. Hazelwood was watching them secretly from the window of the library. He saw that Dick was pleading and she hanging in doubt, and a great wave of anger surged over him that Dick should have to plead to her at all, he who was giving everything, even his own future. "'King's Bench Walk,' he muttered to himself, taking from the drawer of his writing-table a slip of paper on which he had written the address lest he should forget it. Yes, that's the address. And he looked at it for a long time very doubtfully. Suppose that his suspicions were correct. His heart sank at the supposition. Surely he would be justified in setting any trap. But he shut the drawer violently and turned away from his writing-table. Even his pamphlets had become trivial in his eyes. He was brought face to face with real passions and real facts, had been fetched out from his cloister and was blinking miserably in a full measure of daylight. How long could he endure it, he wondered. The question was settled for him that very evening. He and his son were taking their coffee on a paved terrace by the lawn after dinner. It was a dark, quiet night, with a clear sky of golden stars. Across the meadow the light shone in the windows of Stella's cottage. Father, said Dick, after they had sat in constrained silence for a little while, why don't you like Stella any longer? The old man blustered in reply. A lawyer's question, Richard. I object to it very strongly. You assume that I have ceased to like her? It's extremely evident, said Dick dryly. Stella has noticed it. And complained to you, of course, cried Mr. Hazelwood resentfully. Stella doesn't complain. And then Dick leaned over and spoke in the full quiet voice which his father had grown to dread. There rang in it so much of true feeling and resolution. There can be no backing down now. We are both agreed upon that, aren't we? Imagine for an instant that I were first to blazon my trust in a woman whom others suspected by becoming engaged to her, and then endorsed their suspicions by breaking off the engagement. Suppose I were to do that? Mr. Hazelwood allowed his longings to lead him astray. For a moment he hoped. Well, he asked eagerly, you wouldn't think very much of me, would you? Not you, nor any man. A cur, that would be the word, the only word, wouldn't it? But Mr. Hazelwood refused to answer that question. He looked behind her to make sure that none of the servants were within hearing. Then he lowered his voice to a whisper. What if Stella has deceived you, Dick? It was too dark for him to see the smile upon his son's face, but he heard the reply, and the confidence of it stung him to exasperation. She hasn't done that, said Dick. If you are sure of nothing else, sir, you may be quite certain of what I am telling you now. She hasn't done that. He remained silent for a few moments, waiting for any rejoinder, and getting none, he continued, There's something else I wanted to speak to you about. Yes? The date of our marriage. The old man moved sharply in his chair. There's no hurry, Richard. You must find out how it will affect your career. You have been so long at Little Beeding, where we hear very little from the outer world. You must consult your colonel." Dick Hazelwood would not listen to the argument. "'My marriage is my affair, sir, not my colonel's. I cannot take advice, for we both of us know what it would be. And we both of us value it at its proper price, don't we?' Mr. Hazelwood could not reply. How often had he inveighed against the opinions of the sleek worldly people who would add up advantages in a column and leave out of their consideration the merits of the higher life. It would not be fair to Stella were we to ask her to wait, Dick resumed. Any delay, think what would be made of it. A month or six weeks from now, that gives us time enough. The old man rose abruptly from his chair with a vague word that he would think of it, and went into the house. He saw again the lovers, as he had seen them this afternoon, walking side by side slowly towards Stella Ballantyne's cottage. 
and the picture even in the retrospect was intolerable the marriage must not take place yet it was so near a month or six weeks mr hazlewood took up his pen and wrote the letter to henry thresk at last as robert pettifer had always been sure that he would do it was the simplest kind of letter and took but a minute in the writing it mentioned only his miniatures and invited henry thresk to little beading to see them as more than one stranger had been asked before the answers which thresk had given to the questions and notes and queries were pleaded as an introduction and thresk was invited to choose his own day and remain at little beading for the night the reply came by return of post thresk would come to little beading on the friday afternoon of the next week he was in town for parliament was sitting late that year he would reach little beading soon after five so that he might have an opportunity of seeing the miniatures by daylight mr hazlewood hurried over with the news to robert pettifer his spirits had risen at a bound already he saw the neighbourhood freed from the disturbing presence of stella ballantyne and himself cheerfully resuming his multifarious occupations robert pettifer however spoke in quite another strain i am not so sure as you hazlewood the points which trouble me are very possibly capable of quite simple explanations i hope for my part that they will be so explained you hope it cried mr hazlewood yes i want dick to marry said robert pettifer mr hazlewood was not however to be discouraged he drove back to his house counting the days which must pass before thresk's arrival and wondering how he should manage to conceal his elation from the keen eyes of his son but he found that there was no need for him to trouble himself on that point for this very morning at luncheon dick said to him i think i'll run up to town this afternoon father i might be there for a day or two mr hazlewood was delighted no other proposal could have fitted in so well with his scheme the mere fact that dick was away would start people at the pleasant business of conjecturing mishaps and quarrels perhaps indeed the lovers had quarrelled perhaps richard had taken his advice and was off to consult his superiors mr hazlewood scanned his son's face eagerly but learned nothing from it and he was too wary to ask any questions by all means richard he said carelessly go to london you will be back by next friday i suppose oh yes before that i shall stay at my own rooms so if you want me you can send me a telegram dick hazlewood had a small flat of his own in some mansions at westminster which had seen very little of him that summer thank you richard said the old man but i shall get on very well and a few days change will no doubt do you good Dick grinned at his father and went off that afternoon without a word of farewell to Stella Ballantyne. Mr. Hazlewood stood in the hall and saw him go with a great relief at his heart. Everything at last seemed to be working out to advantage. He could not but remember how so very few weeks ago he had been urgent that Richard should spend his summer at Little Beading and lend a hand in the noble work of defending Stella Ballantyne against ignorance and unreason. But the twinge only lasted a moment. He had made a mistake, as all men occasionally do, yes, even sagacious and thoughtful people like himself. And the mistake was already being repaired. He looked across the meadow that night at the lighted blinds of Stella's windows, and anticipated an evening when those windows would be dark and the cottage without an inhabitant. Very soon, he murmured to himself, very soon. He had not one single throb of pity for her now, not a single speculation whither she would go or what she would make of her life. His own defence of her had now become a fault of hers. He wished her no harm, he argued, but in a week's time there must be no light shining behind those blinds. End of chapter 21